Good evening to you all, and a special welcome to visiting students from the Cooper Union in New York City, who are here with us on a joint global studio between our professor Doreen Lewis at one studio, and our invited speaker this evening, Professor Nader Durrani, renowned award-winning design architect, as well as leading architectural educator. Professor Tarani comes from a highly international background. He was born in London, raised in Pakistan, South Africa, Iran, and the US, where he attended Hotchkiss, a boarding school in Connecticut. You will not discover this detail from Wikipedia or other biographies. I happen to know because my three girls all attended Hotchkiss, where he is recognized as one of the most distinguished alumni. Uh, Professor Tarani studied at RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, for his undergraduate degrees in both fine arts and architecture, followed by postgraduate studies in history and theory at the UA, and a Master of Architecture and Urban Design at Harvard Graduate School of Design. Shortly thereafter, he was appointed as assistant, associate, and an adjunct professor at Harvard. Then, professor and head of the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT, and since 2015 has been the Dean of the Cooper Union Urban Association School of Architecture. In addition to his academic leadership roles, Professor Trani is equally renowned as a practicing architect. He founded Office Staff with Rodolf Alcurry, now Dean of the School of Architecture at University of Miami. And they were later joined by Monica Paltadelio, now uh, Dean of Princeton School of Architecture. So I cannot think of any other example of a practice of any size, large or small, where all its partners became contemporaneous <laughs> deans of schools of architecture. His current practice, Nana, was founded in 2011 with two other partners and is based in Boston, New York. Within this brief time, was consistently listed in the top 50 U.S. design firms by Architect Magazine. Um, most importantly, ranked number one in design for three consecutive years. Professor Trani has received numerous international design awards, including the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Architecture, the U.S. Artists Fellowship in Architecture and Design, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, Several design awards for progressive architecture. I think 17 at this count. As well as the American Institute of Architects, Boston Society of Architects, and many others. NADA is a wide ranging practice with portfolios spanning between digital fabrications, residential projects, and large scale institutional buildings, including three schools of architecture, Georgia Tech. University of Melbourne, and most recently, University of Toronto. Again, there must be another kind of record uh, unmatched by any other architectural firm to design three skills in architecture. What impresses me most about Adair Tarani's career is the fluid transition and seamless connection between his dual roles as a practicing architect and architectural educator, where one activity truly informs and enriches the other such that active research takes place within his office with what is called MADLAB to explore digital technology, materials, methods, and manufacturing. And this culture of making and materiality, I'm sure, informs the curriculum and culture that could be. In both instances, whether school or practice, computational design and research-based fabrication are not ends in themselves, but the means to an end, to achieve light, geometry, texture, and materiality, which constitute the essence of the art of architecture. So please join me to extend a warm welcome to Professor Nader Tarani to speak about the main topic of brain. Thank you. 
thank both you and Doreen on behalf of the students uh, for making possible their visit. Uh, we certainly don't take it for granted. Uh, it's incredibly generous of you to host us in the gracious way that you have. And uh, after the crits today, I also come to appreciate uh, the importance of gaining a completely different lens onto some of the intellectual content that we've already been invested for six weeks or so, but come to relearn in, in the span of four hours. If any of you know um, Harry Cobb, you'll also come to appreciate the soothing voice of Nelson himself and the cadence that he has in his introduction. I, I, I really appreciate that. And are you close to Harry? I, I need to ask you, is, it, is, there some, is there a tutelage there, or is this? <laughs> no connection. Um, the talk tonight about the tectonic brain takes uh, all of the complexities of architecture and in a, state, in a strange way reduces them to some uh, really basic fundamentals that I like to speak about and that has to do with the curious material agency of starting architecture with a basic unit and a form of aggregation. Reductive though this may seem, it is a lens through which we inaugurated our practice some many, many years ago and has obviously acquired a, a different level of complexity uh, as it's taken on. Uh, a different kind of form and series of patronage and commissions. When you look at this image, uh, it's quite unremarkable. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a zebra. But when you look more closely, it's only then that you realize that there's something wrong with the image. And you realize that the grain of the image is completely off. It's only once you re-inspect the grain of striping that you realize that it's almost always perpendicular to the extrusion of the torso and the limbs. In architecture, we operate with these grains quite often, and sometimes artificially so. And so as we uh, establish our operations, we're never in confusion about what is natural and what is artificial. Architecture is almost always artificial, and we're completely conscious of that. We make, we make out of wood uh, with a plain saw cut, a quarter saw cut, a rift cut, and so forth. And they produce different natural grains. These are not natural. These are things that we do to them by the way that we cut through them. And from them we gain the pleasure of certain veneers that become the representation of those things would. When we built our first coffee table, we imagined uh, a butcher block system. And as you begin to aggregate plywood in a butcher block system, it produces the semblance of a natural grain, but in fact, it also approximates that kind of condition that you achieve with quarter, quarter sawn wood. And only quarter sawn wood does that because you're going perpendicular to the radius of the wood, of the log, as it were, and gaining the multiplicity of grains. When you look at the relationship between the end grain of the plywood and the Quarters on walnut, it's only then that you begin to appreciate the way in which there's an oblique symmetry to this table that rotates around the Mesian corner, as it were. In turn, you may also appreciate a kind of latent connection between the quarters on walnut on the outside and the zebra wood on the inside, which is explicitly striped. Its grain is, in a way, amplified. You may also begin to appreciate that as you cut the table legs on the diagonal, a kind of figurative moment 
the result of its structural performance, you also gain another type of figuration in the way that uh, essentially the plywood is, uh, is cut against its grain. This for me is no different than the kind of appreciation I have for the architectural orders and the grain that they produce. When I first went to Rome some 30 years ago, I had little appreciation of Bramante, or at least I accepted it as a kind of classical given. I didn't realize neither the heresy nor the anomalies or the strange conditions to which he was submitted. And so I didn't appreciate the way in which the classical orders were engulfed at that moment where you see the capital essentially swallowed by the order of the wall in that corner. It's a kind of moment of uh, realization, a kind of awakening, that here was Bramante drawing up this amazing courtyard, and he forgot to offset the orders in order to reveal the capital, and then became its victim. He was literally swallowed by the orders. Or did he do it self-consciously and in fact knew exactly what he was doing as a heretical moment? This, this to me is being either the victim or the master of the grain. The Rock Creek House is one of those instances where the grain of a Neo-Georgian house takes on a different kind of agency as it's transformed from its classical antecedents to a floor plan that is amplified times four. Essentially a two-story structure that clients wanted to occupy both the attic as well as the basement to double the square footage of the house. And we really worked carefully by excavating the southern elevation to open up the windows to Rock Creek Park and then add that same brick onto this upper level that you see on the street side on the north edge, which makes the southern face essentially a glass wall, essentially an open free plan uh, with a steel frame with brick veneer. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, as we go through this. But what appears to be a brick building, load-bearing wall, transitions from a load-bearing wall condition on the north to a curtain wall condition on the south without revealing ever the seam that is between the two. The plan then is pretty straightforward because it's straddled between the confines of a cubicular structure that was already there with the excavated horizontal openness of a free plan on the southern edge. But most importantly, it gains traction from the north-south party walls that demarcates the original house with its two additions to the east and the west, and the way in which they create a, a, a north-south structural grain, which is what we co-opted as a way of architecturalizing the new insertions of end grain plywood for all of its furnishing and all of its building. The radical move towards this house was A, upon entry from the north end, to create a double height space to double the space of the living room so that there's a winter living room, ground floor level, and a summer living room that opens to the garden in the lower level, and an atrium upon entry that connects you directly up to the top floor, the attic, a playroom for the kids, uh, is basically acoustically accessible all the way down, and a middle level that has a homework room for the kids. This room, or this section, as it were, brings the entire house together, and within it, the grain of the plywood begins to orient itself north-south, revealing that porosity that brings the southern light all the way through the depth of the house, all the way to the northern elevation, while maintaining a kind of compartmentalization on the east-west axis. In fact, 
There are no doors on the east-west axis. There are only moving walls. So the white wall on the right moves to the right to close off the kitchen, and another uh, full-height wooden panel conceals the family room to the left. But the panels of wood, which are approximately two feet wide, establish the left longitudinal grain of a panel, while the end grain reveals the opposite uh, grain on the north-south angle, uh, ascending up in the spiral stair that articulates the core uh, of the house. And then, of course, moments of figuration enable the descent uh, into the basement, which is connected then to the garden level. And all that is mechanical, electrical, and uh, accessory-wise is absorbed within the logic uh, of this paneling system. The only exception to this, of course, is the turning of the corners, which uh, occur particularly on the southeast corner, as we develop a way in which the building at large establishes a connection with the garden. And it's at these moments where the office opens up into the swimming pool at Rock Creek. It's, in fact, you see the Washington uh, Monument just to your left. And establishes, essentially, a, a moment in which the grain of that wood gains a certain depth to create furnishings within the logic of the windows. Shares long uh, seats, libraries, and so forth. And of course, uh, a requisite benefit, the kind of hardware that eliminates essentially door handles and doorknobs and other things, and essentially fits your hand within the logic of the grain. Now the idea of the grain, what results in the customized and the bespoke aspects of the DC house, uh, which ultimately is very expensive, was used in a completely different way in Korea, where we didn't speak the language, we didn't know the construction systems, uh, and we didn't know how to manage a project. But we were told that if you find a way in which to design the building with only four details, you may yet survive the process. The model home gallery is a building type that we don't have in America, and I don't know, but I don't think you have in Hong Kong either. But essentially, it's a building type that is extravagant in its various expressions. You can see here, you know, one for Hyundai, another one for Samsung, and various others. Where what seems to be a civic building or a museum-like building is in fact a temporary structure. Temporary for about 10 years. What happens in them is that they are um, big boxes uh, within which they build about 20 sample apartment units to sell. So it's a sales office, essentially. It's a mall for selling houses. And then the houses that they sell are built in the dozens and dozens of buildings and inserted all over the country. And most of them are pre-sold before even the buildings are built. As a payback to the community within which these model home galleries are built, public amenities are stuffed into the base in the form of auditoria, galleries, cafes, and so forth. To put it more dumbly, it's a glass box at the base with an urban potential to connect to the street, to the park, wherever it is. And the top is meant to be figurative. I say that because our first intuition was to build just that. Nothing more, nothing less. A nice black box on top of a glass space. But their ambitions were great. And they wanted a certain figuration that anticipates sales. This is the documentation of the site uh, as we saw it and documented uh, in a very fast-paced project that was about to happen in no more than a year and three months. We did our working drawings in less than six months. 
we handed them over, I believe, in uh, October, and then we never heard anything back from them again. The project was over. Sometime in January, I got this image in my email, and they said, uh, we need your help. We, we don't know how to turn the corners on this building. Of course, as you can imagine, we had designed the building with the four details I mentioned, but with a certain complexity that required the exactitude of oversight. And building the structure on a 24-hour schedule, eight, eight, and eight, it was able to gain quite a stride over those three months, uh, but not with our input. And essentially, it's composed of a, uh, a, a vertical storefront system at the base, a horizontal louver base system on the top, a, a ground that comes from the outside and goes to the inside, as well as a ceiling strategy. These were our four details. Conceptually, the building was a black box above, completely porous at the base, put in all of the structure, the lighting, mechanical systems, above, so that everything is essentially suspended from above as a series of stalagmites that connect to the ground. The abstraction in this representation is so basic and made it so clear that there really isn't a difference between its projection as an image and its fabrication subsequently. It is not well built. It is not badly built. It is just what it is. But the ability to absorb all of that logic within the striations of its grain was really the, 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 the gamble that we made and essentially won. There are some moments, if you like, of spatial or typological invention, particularly in the moment where we establish the reciprocity between the garage ramp that goes into the basement, the rink of the theater that corresponds to it, the stage of that theater being voided out so it connects back to the gallery and the gardens beyond, and creates a kind of double-sided theater from the inside out and the outside in. So there are moments, if you like, of, of contribution to what is otherwise a white box at the base and a black box above. Now conceptually, it's a hyperstyle hall, except the pylons of those columns acquire a spatiality, sometimes becoming auditoria, other times meeting rooms, another time cafe. But essentially, it's a glass box that you're invited to, uh, to traverse through from an urban condition on the upper right hand, on the upper left hand side, to the park and the subway systems on the lower left. But also malleable enough that the client can interact with it and still maintain the clarity of the party. The grain of the vertical mullions then acquire a certain logic, a stubborn logic, if you will, of vertical striping, a kind of barcoded system that uh, creates an added grain to filter the sun on the south, uh, deepens the fins on the east and west to protect from the extremity of the sun in the morning and in the afternoon, and more open and wide panels to the north where it doesn't make a difference. So effectively, it's a dumb domino frame whose edges are truncated at the top to produce a kind of sinuous figure at the top while shrink wrapping the base of this building in relationship to the very programs that it sustains at the ground floor. The grain of the building, then, is really the result of taking T-beams and T-mullions, striding them down to the ground, recomposing them in relationship to each elevation, densifying them, loosening them up. As the program is set from below, pushing up, 
and the program from above pushes down, a kind of negotiation is made along that horizon line. While the stack logic of louvers above established moments of exposure, but not too much because they only happen in the public spaces above, whereas the majority of it is a kind of interior mall environment for the sales of the units. I present this project not because I like it, nor because it's good. In a, in a strange way, it's uh, of the projects we've done, it's the one I believe in least. It's a kind of bastard child. It's the type of project you can never control. And yet, uh, I like to present it for this particular uh, theme of the tectonic grain because of the way in which it was, it made a bet on the tectonic grain and it became the means through which a certain thing where it was achieved. More recently though, we had a different bet to play and this was for uh, the Tendera Bridge um, in Melbourne uh, along the Yarra River. This was our second collaboration with John Wardle Architects after the School of Architecture. And we had this curious and wonderful possibility of connecting downtown Melbourne, the Yarra River and the parkways, to the Rod Laver Stadium. And those of you who appreciate and love tennis have probably seen the open there all of the time. And this is the only pedestrian bridge that connects to the stadium and is, and is its main threshold. It's not a long span bridge, but it yields a certain civic possibility in transforming an open type. And essentially what we were interested in doing was taking the logic of rebar and the process of bending it and through structural redundancy, uh, gain a kind of filigree structure that wraps around it and produces multiple functions. And through a kind of redundancy, redundancy produces the truss that spans over the highway with it calculating its maximum moment to create the kind of upside down wedge of the truss, while also anticipating moments in which it wraps around to become the railing and subsequently the lamp posts that become part of the skyline uh, of the city. Uh, this is one of those projects that I like in some sense because it serves as a kind of light filigree, a kind of garden structure that gets lost in the garden uh, of the city, uh, but on closer inspection acquires also the spectacular uh, iconographic presence of a folly that uh, is altogether designed in, in a high level of intricacy. But uh, it is also very raw and exposed. It's the skeletal nature uh, of it establishes this relationship between structure and ornament that we rarely get to see. The idea of grain uh, acquires a different meaning in the New Hampshire house. A curious structure uh, designed around an oval courtyard, a series of rooms, each of which establishes a meaningful relationship with the presidential range. In New Hampshire, there's this moment in Bethlehem where you get to see Mount Washington all the way south to uh, Mount Lafayette, Mount Lincoln, and various others. And this house, which gets to see the majesty of this view, is essentially designed around the logic of a panoptic idea that is at once inward looking, but also outward looking. It effectively is a stoa building that is linear, but then torqued around itself to produce a series of voids, much like the dog, dog trunk, to establish a relationship between interior and exterior as it goes around the house. 
the grain with which we were designing, of course, was the grain of a typical rural structure in America. Uh, vertical tongue and groove uh, detailing or board and batten detailing. In this condition, uh, I'm using the uh, New England house as an example because it was built before that one. The idea of using a tectonic system that eliminates all hardware, uh, a blank facade that absorbs the door handles of the garage literally within the unfolding and the bending of wood uh, for the garage doors. In the context of the New Hampshire house, of course, the torquing around of these rooms enables one to frame individually the room of each mountain in relationship to each room. And that also produces these interstitial spaces that become outdoor rooms for their adjoining spaces. A kind of balcony for a bedroom or for the living room, a large deck for barbecuing, and so forth and so on. The resultant frame, of course, is that each room has this uh, amazing view, uh, but also from the outside in, with a sense of protection, a clear frame to the inside courtyard the sum total of which describes the figure of the building in the round. Now, as a plan-making technique, in an age when the plan no longer matters, uh, the composition of the plan was of great importance to us because of the way in which prefabricated cubes are conjoined with each other at uh, moments of customization where two morphologies are grafted together and smoothed over through a kind of uh, uh, seamless uh, tectonic. The basement uh, of this building is where the garage is. And then you come up through a stair connecting to the threshold that is the main door of the house. So as the stair comes up, there's another stair that takes you up to the deck. In correspondence to that, you begin to see the unfurling of the gateway into this house essentially take on a shrink-wrapped figure of that stair as it ascends to the roof, forming the entryway into the house in relationship to the drop-off, and then a sacred inner sanctum, which is its courtyard, where essentially you gain uh, a protection from the outside. This is in the mountains of New Hampshire, so there are deer, there are bears, there's a, a range of other things, so that within this kind of uh, elaborate landscape, there's also this moment of protection. Now, the assembly of these rooms is actually aggregated by a series of vertical fins, as I said. Uh, tongue and groove, a stacking, uh, board and batten, allows for an incremental rotation that enables the figuration of that threshold into the site, but also the elaboration of a figure that eventually becomes uh, the excuse for the large portals that open up onto the landscape. It's minimal, but also quite elaborate at the same time. Uh, it's able to take on many configurations. The planimetric operations that we've undertaken are, of course, quite known to you. From Kahn to Sterling to a variety of other precedents, you begin to see the markings of a uh, a planimetric idea that refuses collage on the one hand, uh, but also refuses the impulse of expressionism on the other. It is a tense negotiation between the two and reconciled, particularly on that inner liner that begins to conjoin the interior and the exterior, where a single corridor brings together its various fragments. What makes this possible, of course, is the grain of its tectonics. Uh, 
the wood picket system, essentially from left to right, produces the louver system that becomes the fence of the courtyard. As it begins to close on into itself, the walls of the warden, uh, excuse me, the tongue and roof system. Uh, as it becomes doors and uh, other things that require hardware, the board matten system, the frames of the window acquire a depth, and of course the balconies get separated by wall fins. So all of these vertical pickets add slightly different scales.
low buildings, mid-rise, and high-rise in various degrees of shade that you can see. With our building, unapologetically object-like, oval, operating in the round as the one civic structure within uh, a medley of uh, commercial buildings. The one object building that you see in the distance that announces itself in the round. Simply said, uh, it's a series of public programs at the base with a lobby in the green that conjoins uh, the two theaters above it with the one theater below it and a gallery and uh, uh, public space for the entry. Uh, a lobby that also becomes another theater, a kind of casual seating system with a theater that anticipates 250 people. This building then is all about the internalization of the program so that the promenade can be brought to its exterior, making public that ascent, but also establishing a rapport with the city itself. Then on top, the administration, the media center, uh, the mechanical systems uh, that crown the building with all of its other ensuing programs and the narrative of that circulation ascending the building all the way to the top. The sum total of which produces a kind of cap to the building. The one contribution we made to their programs was a theater basically at the top that then has a prospect over the city and connects to uh, the skyline of Seoul. As we began to develop an idea about the logic of its tectonics, we also realized the radical limitations of the budget. And so we realized that if we establish a relationship with the film, unraveling, as it were, around this banding, that there's, there could be a relationship with flat stock uh, perforated metal that establishes a direct relationship with the slabs of the stairs, the theaters, and the horizontal offices that begin to cascade up and down, negotiating a normal access to each of its local conditions. And so essentially, with the porosity of that skin, and the uh, permeability of the light that comes through it, you begin to see a kind of multiple narrative of these interiors and exteriors as they begin to negotiate in relationship to each other. The provenance of that building then is anticipated in relationship to a series of cinematic sequences, all the time anticipating a certain relationship uh, with the building. So for instance, at the base of the building, uh, there is the entry uh, uh, to the sidewalk that connects to the back alleyways where the restaurants are, the sidewalk space that invites other events that occur here, sometimes closed off, sometimes open, but also creates a kind of gallery, a cafe at the base that takes advantage of the light from the street to come into the basement. In turn, the narrow spaces of the ascent as you go upstairs, establishes a relationship with other cinematic sequences with which you're quite familiar, but in fact here it takes on another and more public role as those narrow spaces are given moments of respite as you essentially have uh, wider passages and lobbies that gain a relationship with the outdoors as the plans are carved out from the inside out and the outside in. The perforated skin then establishes meaningful relationships with areas that are more dense and areas, if you like, that are more light 
but that experiences the city in the round. You can see the program through it, but as much you can see the program of the city from within it as you look outside. Here you can see uh, a panoramic sequence uh, as it establishes a panning moment within which one slides from one window all the way down to the opposite side. On the upper levels, where you have the library and a kind of reading room, also a smoking balcony that connects the ribbon window all the way through to a public moment that reframes the city from a different perspective all the while acknowledging the grain of the corrugated metal as the basis for the anticipation of these deformations. So this reciprocity between the internal organization of the building and the exterior conditions of its fenestration and the slabs that create these anamorphic moments that are the basis for uh, its articulation is in great part the way in which some of the discrete elements of its architecture were conceived as unitary moments that make sense on their own without needing to uh, establish a, a systemic relationship with all of the other windows. As a civic building, this is one of those curious moments where you do not have the responsibilities of an office building or a housing and, a, a, and, a, a, and allows for the kind of figurative freedom that uh, this otherwise economic system allows. And then as a kind of uh, element at the top, uh, a public theater uh, at the very top that on the day, uh, during the daytime can be a Belvedere overlooking the city, uh, but then uh, at nighttime becomes uh, uh, a kind of site for cinema as part of the skyline of the city uh, allows and anticipates in relationship to its skyline. secret that we're interested in two modalities of work. And we spoke a little bit about this in the prints before, but I didn't articulate it like this. But we're interested in the configurative act of making architecture piece by piece. As you can see from the nest on the right hand side, a bird has to discern that out of each blade of grass, something larger can be made. But you and I can readily understand the relationship between the figure of the nest and the figure of the bowl. And should that bowl be cast out of concrete, it is made out of aggregates nonetheless, smaller molecular parts that can be broken down into elements. We are interested in that tense relationship between figuration on the one hand and configuration on the other. We had the occasion uh, in Korea to do a folly for the Guangzhou Biennale that took door handles, a series of fragments, to create an environment that is the result of something incalculable, although pure as an overall figure, connected to the ground uh, by some erratic points where there was no infrastructure, no pipes, no access points to the infrastructure of the subway system, with a pure figure at the top, we developed a tectonic grain that was the result of structural parameters. In other words, a column has compressive forces uh, pushing down onto it, a capital has the, uh, has the responsibility of distributing loads 
that are spanning from the sides down into that column. And of course, the canopy above is essentially functioning as a truss. It has triangulated properties that need to be welded in at least three points in order to provide for the redundancies to allow for the spanning of this uh, atmospheric cloud that is overhead. Designed by us, but fabricated by the owner of the Door and Lock Museum, each of these stainless steel bars are literally doors, door handles that you would use on a commercial fenestration, welded uh, in distinct parts to give this grain that is both ephemeral and present depending on the view from which you look at it. Now, it's also no secret that a lot of our practice has gained a certain momentum as a result of a range of installations that become proto-architectural in anticipating larger architectural moves. One of our obsessions has led to a series of experiments, both at the small and at the civic scale. And that is the, the magic of the suspended structure. All of you are familiar with Caesar's expo structure, suspended in tension. Others of you are also familiar with uh, Khan's canonical structure over the canals in Venice that was never built. But obviously, as by now you can see, my fascination with that is not that it's structural, but the idea that the structure establishes a direct programmatic relationship with the theaters on the inside. It also establishes a relationship with the performance that you can anticipate. Gaudi would hang chains as a basis for optimizing the construction of arches. And we did something similar in anticipation of the compressive catenary vault that we fabricated upside down for the BSA. Working first as a test with paper clips uh, to imagine how hybrid structures may be anticipated. In this case, we asked ourselves, what would it mean to build a compressive system, but with tensile logic? Imagine building with compressive blocks using the keystoning systems that you've seen in the Escorial flat arch, for instance, and translating that logic to high-density foam. What you need to do is to invert the logic of the keystone and make it an interlocking puzzle system such that the, the lock is anticipated not in the center of the vault, but in every unit in itself. And in that interlocking moment, enables the suspension of a delicate blanket that is the result of each of these units as they interlock. Here you can see, uh, as you ascend from the entry of the BSA, it's suspended above you. And as you come closer to it, uh, the three points of its suspension with the puzzle system that interlocks all of it with the inversion of its oculus, essentially where the keystone would be, a, a, an oculus pulls itself apart with the key, keystoning moments on the edges. It is, of course, a compressive system. This is not a tensile system as you would anticipate it to be, much like this butcher block piece of furniture uh, for this table structure which gains its logic not only from the stacking of wood, but the concealment of its structure as the drawers come out of the structural grain of its support systems. This instead is supported by uh, a kind of tensile system only at its corners, where it gains traction from the eye beams above and reveals the faceted lock system on the inside, where in fact, you can stand.
So what is this connection to the schools of architecture? It so happens that two of these architecture systems gain a certain meaning because of the suspended studios that are within them. The Georgia Tech on the left and the Melbourne School of uh, Architecture in the middle. Um, and a very different system, of course, on the right where we have the Toronto School of Architecture. I will go through these very fast. Um, but simply to say that in the Georgia Tech School of Architecture, we had this high base structure with an existing gantry crate, and it gave rise to an interpretation of a flexible space that could drag out of the structural logic of the space a delicate system of a studio uh, that is able to suspend the logic uh, of that uh, building. In Melbourne, a similar structural logic from spanning wood members, monolithic LBLs that span 22 meters, we suspended a monolithic wood structure three stories without it getting gaining any support from the ground. As that structure descends, it goes from the monolithic to the veneer system as it thins out and inverts the kind of logic that you would anticipate. In Toronto, a very different logic as we developed a roof system, a structural grain again, that is working in collusion with the idea of a long span structure a daylighting system and a hydrological system whereby all of the water of the roof goes down the two sides in order to irrigate the site. This one deserves a little bit more mention because it has uh, one of those battles that ultimately we won. Uh, not unlike many of our other buildings, it was deemed too expensive and impossible to build. So on one of my trips to Melbourne, I called the studio immediately and said, let's build one of those vaults inside of our basement, if only to demonstrate that it's possible. They had already received a model that was about this big of the roof, but had claimed to us, this is just a model. Anybody can build a model. But to build the whole thing, unfortunately, costs a million dollars over budget. By building a stud system, that repeats itself over the length of our basement, we demonstrated that this is in fact a developable surface, a ruled surface. And by the drilling of a plaster system into it and a radiant panel into it, one could discretize that surface into a truss system and then adhere the radiant panel plaster systems onto the ceiling and essentially bring in a folded structural system, not concrete, but in steel, in fact, with about $700,000 in savings. Here, of course, embedded within the narrative of the tectonic grain is an idea about the instrumentality that the architect may yet bring to the means and methods of fabrication if we were to own the construction process of ourselves. And it's within this context that we were able to advance some idea that what we do within the context of the studio still matters. Operating within the scale of institutions on the one hand and small houses on the other, this house is just being built and completed in southern France. Essentially, it is a courtyard building that is slipped between two levels, the living rooms uh, on the upper level and the bedrooms on the lower level, straddled by a courtyard within which is a swimming pool that conjoins the two. Um, the kind of torqued parallelogram plan uh, gives privacy to these rooms so that one can essentially stand nude in the pool without the neighbors seeing you, but gain the full view of the Mediterranean beyond. But in the basement have 
essentially transferable dorm rooms that could house 7 to 22 people, depending on how you use them. The logic of the plan, then, is to accommodate the eccentricities of the site plan, gaining the best views, not only downhill, but also uphill into the forest, accounting for the slope of the site to develop a massing strategy that gains views for all of the volumes, but then a circulational loop that connects the building as a unitary element, combining all of them into a promenade that draws the landscape into the building under this threshold, up into the courtyard, through the living room, and up into the forest. As much of an object this house may seem from the point of view of, of, of arrival, it is really a landscape piece. At this one moment, as you're entering the house, it yields a view onto the Mediterranean, the pool. Much like a case study house, it is an extruded glass logic with a retaining wall to the right. And simply what we do is we begin to unfold the roof to allow for access of light and air to the west. And a structural logic that does not merely span the width of the building, but actually the length of the building in a kind of civic gesture towards the monumentality of the uh, umbrella pines to the west. The logic of the building then gains a different traction in relationship to the structural grain of the building. The front facade was not merely a facade. It was a necessary beam that is supported by the staircase that is anchored at the corner of the house on the opposing end, supported by the retaining wall that is the wall of the swimming pool. So this wall on the edge of the swimming pool extends all the way into the house and intercepts the front facade in order to allow for the passage of circulation under and through the building, stealthily implanted within the logic of the organization of the plan. Now, this is the first time that we ever worked in concrete. So unlike the stacking of brick, or the aggregation of wood, or the assembly of glass, it's the first time that we're dealing with a liquid medium. Essentially, concrete is a liquid that only once it is cured does it acquire a kind of legibility. And that legibility is either the result of the form work that you've anticipated, or post-concrete work that produces the kind of rustication that you might anticipate. Some of the most extravagant and extraordinary work that we've also seen in the work of Fizak, amongst others, is the fabric form work of concrete that becomes animate in its expression. So we were in search of two ways of beginning to find a new logic within this tectonic grain. One of them was representational. That if we develop a digital formwork that mediates between the smooth and abstraction of the front facade and the rusticated uh, stonework of the retaining walls of the French complex, you may go from the smooth and crisp edge on the right to the kind of rusticated, rough formwork to the left. And somehow, while we're interested in this as an operation, we realize its shortcomings as a kind of representational strategy. We said, OK, what would it mean if we looked at the aggregate of concrete itself, the molecular structure of the concrete, to anticipate 
the smooth conditions of an interior in relationship to the actual retaining walls on the outside, panelizing the formwork, and increasing the size of the aggregate to the point that it actually becomes the mortar in between large pieces of stone, which are what divide the property from other pro properties in the first place. And so the tectonic system of this building emerges from this curious logic. And right now, they're in the process of building some of its uh, more smooth parts. And here you can see also the connection between the concrete, the wood formwork, the striations of the wood, and the aggregate, which emerges from the kind of red-hewn red earth of, of that uh, context. In thinking about the grain of architecture, I returned to Rome recently, uh, where I was in the American Academy, and I was reminded about a discovery I made some years ago. And that is that when I first went to Rome, I had no idea why streets were made up of these cobblestones and what relationship they had to pattern. It's only when you think about it that it has a direct relationship with the body and labor that somebody has to sit on their knees and the tectonic grain is the result of the sweeping arch of an arm that incrementally moves forward as they build the streets. Imagine that for over 2,000 years, the logic of the body is the very same thing that produces the tagging system in subway systems and other kinds of graffiti you see around the city. It is only now that we anticipate uh, a different kind of tectonic grain with the elimination of the hand through digital fabrication, through 3D printing, and other such things that allow for essentially a wholesale challenge to this entire lecture that excites me to rethink all of the things that I just presented to you. But underlying this is a kind of fascination with the material and the narrative aspects of architecture. Uh, something that harks back to the classical antiquities. And my innocent, though belated discovery after my graduation from RISD of the logic of uh, the Greek temple. I never understood for some reason that uh, these stone structures have a direct relationship with uh, the wooden logic of trusses that span them. And so the triglyphs, of course, have a direct relationship with the spanning of beams that goes the width of the building. And if you accept this narrative, then you'll also accept the petrification of that wood to stone because it's part of the fiction that is played out. But then all of a sudden, as you turn the corner and you see the triglyphs turn the corner, there's a crisis. A crisis of representation, a crisis of actuality, because all of a sudden you realize here particularly at the corner where the triglyphs are shifted from the center of the column to their corners, that it is the narrative of architecture that holds the discipline together and not its actuality. And part of the pleasure of what we do has to do with the negotiation of its facts and its fictions. Thank you very much. <laughs>